Welcome back to another video this is a part 9 of. What if Issei fell in love with Sona after Rias broke his heart? I don't really want to drag out the intro so let's get started. Chapter 33, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Okay, so a quick announcement before we begin. This is gonna be a really long chapter. As I mentioned previously, I am getting things lined up. Also, this chapter has a bombshell toward the end. Mind you, I am trying to keep this close to novel canon aside from Momo's hair color lol. I had a poll in my discord regarding whether I should keep it the novel color or white from the anime, consensus was white, so yeah. Okay, onward, enjoy, this one took me two days to write. Chapter 33, damn, what a day. Scene, Yusaka Castle, Den Room. As the peerage decided to take advantage of Yusaka's indoor Olympic-sized swimming pool, Seraphal, Sona, Yusaka, Kuno and a sleeping Issei, were all left in the living area of the large home. Yusaka made her way back from the kitchen as she was carrying a small tray with traditional Japanese tea. Meanwhile her little daughter came running behind with her very own tray which held all of the tea mugs. Both girls had matching and very warm smiles. Meanwhile, Seraphal was sitting on the floor while on her knees, near the television. She was using her lap as a pillow for the recovering Issei Hyodo as she was cheerfully playing with his hair. As that was happening, Sona was sitting on the couch, watching the scene play out. She had a mildly worried look as she stared toward Issei. However, whenever the Citri heiress laid her eyes upon her jitty sister, she would instantly scowl. About 10 minutes ago, as Seraphal was carrying the sleeping teen in a bridal-style embrace, she had declared that Issei should wake up to none other than his hero, Milky Chan. Before Sona could protest, Seraphal gave her little sister, the look. It was her serious face, the one that means you didn't argue back. The heiress then remembered what her sister had said right afterwards. She couldn't deny that her sister was right. But still, she didn't have to like it, not even a little bit. Satan, You've slept with him all this time. Well guess what, tonight, he's mine. Seraphal then stomped off with Issei ahead of Sona and Tsubaki as both girls had their jaws agape. After this small flashback, Sona sat back on the couch and tried to relax. Kuno had put her tray onto the coffee table while sitting down on the floor next to her, Auntie, and Papakun. Before Sona could think any more about it, she had a cup of tea being presented to her by Yusaka who was now sitting directly next to Sona on the couch. Taking hold of the tea, Sona showed a small smile of gratitude. Yusaka then takes a sip from her own cup while closing her eyes. She smiles softly and takes a small breath. Era era, Sona-chan, I must admit, you worry me my darling. You seem so very, worked up, as they say, might I suggest some calming techniques. Sona raises an eyebrow. While showing her usual stoic mannerism, the heiress replies. I assure you, Yusaka-sama, I am quite well, thank you. Sona takes another sip of her tea. Yusaka nods, however her eyes are still closed. With all due respect, Sona, you can lose the honorifics. While you're at it, allow me to help you understand that it is impossible to hide your emotions from a creature such as myself. Sona tilts her head in confusion. Meanwhile, Seraphal turns her attention toward her little sister and then slightly grins. Kuno continues to look at the sleeping teen while ignoring the others. Unknown to anyone, minus the little fox princess, Issei's eyes had opened. Seeing Kuno, Issei smiled while winking. Kuno returns the wink while making a shush sound with her lips. Deciding that he would play whatever game this kid was imagining, Issei made an A-OK -okay, with his own lips. The comfortable teen was not going to complain about his situation. After a quick glance with his eyes, he noticed that Sona and Yusaka were sitting on the couch, apparently having some sort of serious chat. That meant that this lap had to be Seraphal's. Oh yes, Issei was definitely going to take all of this in, there was no doubt about it. Yusaka then opened one of her eyes as her usual smile turned into a half smirk. So, you are into, oh, era era. Sona-chan, I would have never guessed. Oh, and that too. Sona's eyes widened at this while immediately rushing toward the fox queen and placing both of her hands over the woman's mouth. Yusaka began to laugh heartily even though Sona was attempting to muffle her. Instantly, 
Sona's arms were now covered in golden fur as the queen's tails began to wrap themselves around the petite heiress. Before Sona knew it, she was wrapped in all nine tails of Yusaka as the woman was now softly patting the heiress's head. Era era, there there, be a good girl now. Don't worry, we can keep this all a secret, you know, between us girls. Yusaka then showed an all-out grin. Without a chance to reply, Sona found her face now being squished by Yusaka's massive breasts as the Yukai queen began to hug the little heiress relentlessly. Seraphal begins to laugh. Issei can feel the super devil's thighs against his cheek as she bounces up and down. Kuno then tilts her head at this and then produces a smirk of her own. Mommy, Issei Kun is awake. Kuno was now pointing at a slightly drooling Issei as his arms were now wrapped around Seraphal's waist. Seraphal looked down and smiled brightly. Yasaka turned her attention toward Seraphal and began to giggle. Now looking down toward Sona, the Fox Queen smiles. Era era. Before you get comfortable in there, I should tell you that your boyfriend is truly enjoying your sister's lap. Yusaka then smirks again. Sona struggles as Yusaka won't let go. Issei, don't you do anything perverted just because I am. MMMHHHHHFFFFF. Oh now, relax, won't you? I'll let you out of there the moment you calm down. Think of this as one of the techniques that I mentioned earlier. Hee <laughs> hee. Yusaka now looks back toward Seraphal. The Mao looks to be holding the now struggling Issei in place this time. Boo, you were just having fun, why do you want to leave now? Don't worry, so Tan can't get you this time. That's not the point. Issei now has his arms thrashing about the place as Seraphal now has both of her arms wrapped around the teen's sides. Kuno meanwhile is clapping her hands while singing to herself. Megane o Kaketa Baka Obasan. Mama wa Kanojo o Muke ni Iki. Kanojo ni Imashida. Kanojo wa Watashi no Papa o Shutoku Shimasen. Yasaka sama, pardon my intrusion, however, there are three guests that have just arrived. A masked guard wearing a white and red kimono had marched into the room while holding onto a spear like weapon. Still holding onto a struggling Sona sea tree, Yasaka turns her attention toward the guard while tilting her head. Guests, you say, interesting, I wasn't expecting anyone today. Very well. You may escort them in. Yes ma'am. The guard then left the room. Yasaka takes a deep breath as she slowly releases Sona who had now stopped her struggling. Seraphal also let go of Issei as he scooted toward the wall near the TV while smiling nervously. Yasaka then stands from the couch while adjusting her headpiece. Sona is sitting on the couch while grinding her teeth. She then turns her attention toward a flustered looking Issei. Seeing her, the team thought it best to go to her side before any more surprises happened. Standing up, Issei nervously walked toward the heiress while sitting beside her. Hey, Issei smiled and rubbed the back of his hair. Sona's scowl turns into her usual frown, however there was a small smile. Behind it, PFF'd. Hey, Seraphal also stood up and was next to Yusaka as the two gave each other a quick glance. Then the girls both smirked and winked toward one another. Kuno then stood up while brushing her outfit off. She then looks toward her mother and Seraphal. Afterwards she sees Issei and Sona sitting on the couch. Seeing the two looking at each other made something snap inside the little fox princess head. Before anger could take hold, Kuno noticed that Issei was sitting straight and not with his legs crossed. An idea came to mind. The little fox girls now began to grin once again. As Issei was trying to think of something to say, he felt pressure on his own lap suddenly. When this happened, the almost smiling Sona now began to scowl like never before. Looking down, Issei noticed the little fox princess, sitting on his lap. She was doing this while sticking her tongue out toward Sona. Slowly, the sea tree heiress's cheeks began to puff out. Sorry to show up like this without an announcement beforehand. But, wouldn't you know it? I gotta get back to Gregory soon, so I thought I would take the chance to have a talk with Shorty over there. Issei could recognize this voice and turned his head toward the family den entrance. It was that, Azzy, guy. He was smiling directly at Issei while throwing both of his hands into the air. His gesture was that of peace. Seraphal immediately ran toward the couch and sat on the opposite side of Issei while taking hold of his arm in her own and holding tightly. Milky is here. She had a look of sheer concern as her attention would go back and forth from Issei and toward Azazel. Issei lifted an eyebrow and noticed that the man wasn't alone. 
The white-haired girl from the other night was also with him, not to mention, the silver-haired punk that couldn't handle losing to Smash Brothers. Yasaka then folds her arms while smiling politely. Azazel-kun, why hello? And hello, friends of Azazel-kun. The white-haired girl who was wearing a black and gray kimono bowed politely. Greetings your highness, my name is Lint, it's an honor to be in your presence. Yasaka softly giggles into her sleeve. He he he, era era, such a polite young woman. I like you very much. The silver-haired teen, who was wearing a matching gray yukata, the same as Azazel, simply nods while keeping his eyes closed. Valley, it's a pleasure, he said this in a flat tone. Yasaka nods back but she doesn't giggle or smile, rather she shows a very serious frown. The White Dragon Emperor, I know of you and your dragon knows of me. Isn't that right, Albon? Issei thinks to himself, the White One. Yes, the White One. So, that's his new host. Be warned partner, this one has always been a thorn in my ass. Aside from another specific blue one, this White One is almost just as bad. Wait, hold your horses. Are you trying to tell me that we have enemies simply due to association with, well, you? It's a long story, partner. Existing for as long as I have, enemies are assured at some point down the line. Valley begins to smirk toward Yusaka as he folds his arms. And, what of it, Fox? Azazel now begins to nervously rub the back of his head. Hee hee, what can I say? I am obsessed with sacred gears. Call it a curse if you like. As Issei has one of his arms in Seraphals, the team lifts his free one while he begins to pat a smiling kuno on her head. He then looks at both Sona and then Seraphal while nodding. Afterward, Issei looks toward Azazel and shows a small smile. What do you want from me, fallen angel? Azazel then wipes a sweat drop from his forehead while smiling nervously. Hey, kiddo, say, I kinda want to have a talk with ya. Beep 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 beep. A loud noise was coming from Lint's pocket as she pulled out a phone. Instantly, her calm demeanor turned into something more flustered. As her red eyes began to widen in a shocked motion, the petite girl now put her phone down as began to tug on Azazel's kimono. Turning his attention toward Lint, Azazel was now looking at her phone screen. Facepalming, Azazel nods. It's fine, go to your convention. Valley tilts his head while peeking over Lint's shoulder only to see something that interested the silver-haired teen. I'm going too. Azazel now stares toward a determined-looking Valley in confusion. Um, sure, okay. Right afterwards, the sounds of multiple footsteps could be heard, coming from down the hallway. Within moments, Ruruko was in the room, wearing a yellow and black bathing suit. She was wearing a towel over her head and she looked to be panting heavily. Did I hear one of you say something about a convention? Ruruko was now starring toward the lint, Azazel and Valley with stars in her eyes. Not ten seconds afterwards, the rest of the peerage was all present and accounted for, all in their swimwear. Tsubaki looked a bit flustered. Adjusting her glasses, Tsubaki clears her throat. Ahem, Ruruko, that was rude to run down the hallway like that. The rest of you, that was also rude to chase after Ruruko and down the hallway like that. Very disrespectful, a panting Saji smirks, weren't you also running, Vice President, Momo steps on Saji's foot while puffing her cheeks out, what did I tell you about being a smartass, Tsubaki shakily replies to Saji's comment, CA, CA, can it, Saji, Lint proceeds to show her phone toward Ruruko and then the rest of the peerage start to gather round and excitement begins to fill the room. Seraphal now jumps from the couch as she pecks Issei on his cheek before skipping toward Lint. Love you, darling, ooh, convention. Let me see. Sona facepalms at her sister's actions. Issei continues to pat Kuno absentmindedly as he cannot process all of the different and random things happening all at once. So he just blankly smiles and nods randomly. Yasaka chose to take Seraphal's spot on the couch, beside Issei and sat down. Meanwhile, Azazel cleared the way through the group of teenagers that surrounded him while they chatted among themselves regarding their individual excitement. As he finally pushed himself in between and through Tsubasa and Tsubaki, Azazel noticed Issei giving him a suspicious and fake smile. Deciding to sit down on the opposite couch, the governor proceeds to look at the situation in front of him. Tilting his head, Azazel finishes looking at each of the girls while finally laying his violet eyes on Issei. Well, 
Kid, you're quite the ladies' man. Yusaka now takes hold of Issei's other arm while placing it in her lap. She then looks back at the governor with her trademark crescent-shaped smile. Azazel-kun. Yusaka then closes her golden eyes as her voice drops down an octave. What do you want with my husband? If Azazel was taking a drink, he would have spit it out. Oh, wow, I was going to say this was all very interesting, but that would be an understatement. The governor turns his attention to a flustered Issei. Say kid, how old are you? I mean, are you legally allowed to be married? I mean, we are in Japan and all, but seriously. You're married to Yusaka of Kyoto. Sona clears her throat while adjusting her glasses. Governor Azazel, I must repeat what Yusaka Sam. Yusaka turns her attention to Sona while showing a scary smirk. Sona gets it and takes a large gulp. I mean, I must repeat what Yusaka, Chan asked. Sona's cheeks began to puff out. Meanwhile Yusaka nods in approval as her smile now looks genuine. Sona took a breath and continued. What do you want with Issei? Azazel now begins to study the Citri heiress as he nods slowly. His smirk turns into a quick and sudden grin. Oh, I see, now this, this right here is very interesting. So, not only Seraphal Leviathan, but her little sister. Wow, Azazel turns his attention back to a now blushing Issei. Wow, consider me impressed. Even from my own personal standards, which are up there, mind you, your own personal achievements as of yet, are very impressive. Great job, kiddo. Yusaka slowly uses her free hand to pull a folded paper fan from her cleavage. Issei notices this while internally shrieking in horror. Azazel begins to laugh hysterically. Sona begins to scowl toward the governor while her patience wears thin. Then, smack, we now see the governor laying sideways on the couch he was sitting in. Now rubbing the side of his head, Azazel's smile was literally, fanned, from his face. Issei watched in fear as Yusaka slowly refolded the paper fan while sliding it down the massive trench that was the fox queen's cleavage. She then turned toward her husband while winking. She did this while showing a look of satisfaction. Sona watched this all play out in slow motion and enjoyed it very much. Azazel sat back up, while still rubbing his head. Coffee. Issei tilts his head. What about coffee? Azazel places an index finger into the air as his smirk returns. We should have a cup of coffee together, you know, at a cafe or something. Sona shakes her head, absolutely not. After all, what could you possibly want to speak with Issei about, that couldn't be said here. Azazel's smirk turned into a solemn frown. Well, that's the thing. See, even though I had nothing to do with it, still, indirectly, it was still my fault. I think the kid knows what I mean. Yusaka closes her eyes as her hand tightens on top of Issei's, which was still on her lap. Yes, Azazel-kun, that would be alright. I understand, Issei, you should go with him. Perhaps afterwards, we can meet in Kyoto Square for this convention everyone seems to be excited about. I am sure my little Kuno wouldn't mind, would you, darling? Yusaka turns her attention to her daughter, who was sitting happily on Issei's lap. Kuno nodded, yes. That sounds fun. I bet they have lots of milky spiral goodies. Also, we don't have to hide these, yay. The little fox princess now begins to lightly pull on her fox ears. Issei thought for a moment. Then it made sense. Oh, right, because your average human would think you're all cosplaying. Heck, that makes a lot of sense. Good thinking, Kuno. Kuno nods victoriously. Yup, now you're catching on, Papa Kun. She then hops off of Issei while running toward the large group of teenagers which included Seraphal. Hey let me see, Moo. Yusaka giggles into her sleeve. Era era. Well then, Sona-chan, don't you worry about our Issei. The fox has her attention on the Citri heiress. Lifting her pinky finger now, Yusaka winks. Sona shows a look of confusion, that was until Issei's arms seemed to force themselves around the fox queen's waist. Instantly the teen was hugging Yusaka as he seemed to be doing it by his own means, however this was not the case. Finding his face in between warm and jiggly pairs of warm flesh, Issei knew exactly where he was. Struggling, he couldn't seem to control his own body aside from breathing. Speaking of, the teen noticed how much Yusaka smelled of fresh strawberries and how it somehow reminded him of something else. As that was happening, Yusaka was giggling while still presenting her pinky into the air. 
The finger itself looked to have a thin and red energetic type of thread. At further glance, this thread was wrapped around her arms and body, which looked to be what was also holding Issei in place. His wrists and arms were also bound around the voluptuous queen of Yukai and ended at his single pinky finger. As this was happening, Yusaka turned toward Sona while smirking. The red string of fate, my dear. Along with my own mastery of the spiritual realm, Issei Hyodo and myself are eternally linked. Within my city, I will always know where he is. I will also know his thoughts and actions. As Sona looked gobstocked, Azazel began to smile nervously. Yasaka turns her attention now to the governor. Squinting her eyes a bit, Yasaka shows a serious snarl. As Issei continued his pointless struggle, Yasaka stood slowly. Let me make myself perfectly clear, Azazel kun. If so much as a hair is harmed on this boy's head. Issei finally is able to wriggle his head from out of his wife's cleavage. Taking a deep breath of air, Issei opens his mouth. Hey, come on, stop talking about me as if I ain't in the room. Yasaka smirks as she shakes her chest from left to right. Issei instantly gets smothered again. Smiling victoriously, Yasaka replies as she looks down at the squished face of her husband. Quiet in there, mommy is talking. Instantly, Sona and Azazel now both look at each other while exchanging lifting eyebrows. Azazel then turns back toward Yasaka, who looked to be enjoying Issei's current predicament. Smiling nervously, Azazel clears his throat. Oh, don't worry, I really ain't the fighting or killing type. My track record speaks for itself. Well, as long as we are talking about post-war. Azazel now rubs the back of his neck. Yasaka nods as she then snaps her finger. Issei's body was released from the red string magic, however he didn't seem to let go. Sona watched in anger as Issei's arms were still wrapped around Yasaka's waist while he moved his head back and forth. Yasaka herself was looking down while blushing madly. Azazel then cleared his throat while showing a sudden smirk. Hey, kid, if you can hear me in there, the jig is up and the smaller sea tree devil looks like she wants to crush your balls or something. Yasaka shows a stern look toward Azazel. Language, please. Removing his hold on Yasaka, Issei pulled his head from her cleavage with a bit of difficulty as the woman insisted on hugging him back. Afterwards he looked toward Sona, nervously smiling while gasping for air. Sona simply puffed her cheeks out while crossing her arms. Scene Kyoto Village Square. Why do we have to go out and have coffee? We could have just had some back at the castle. Issei was walking along with Azazel as both of his hands were supporting the back of his neck as he lazily followed along. Well, let's just say that I've gotten some information regarding your own unique taste when it comes to certain establishments. Azazel was softly grinning as he then pointed toward a building across the street. Tilting his head, Issei read the sign. Mido Cafe Kyoto. Issei then looked back toward Azazel with some suspicion behind his eyes. A maid-themed cafe. Azazel nods. Yup. I heard about this one from a few friends of mine. It's quite popular from what I hear. Also, the girls have great bodies. Also, I heard you're a breast man. Issei nods proudly. Boobs are the greatest. I see. Well, I heard there was this one maid that works there. I haven't met her in person, but from what I hear, she is really tall and has an amazing rack. Nothing compared to your wife, as I am sure you would know but still, nothing to gawk at. Azazel was nodding in all seriousness while remembering Issei doubling as Yusaka's bra minutes earlier. Issei blushes a bit however he continues walking toward the entrance. Well, as long as I don't get caught, looking technically ain't cheating, right? Azazel once again nods in all seriousness. Wise words, wise words indeed. Once the two walked through the doors, they were greeted by a pair of maids. The first of the two was very tall. She had yellow eyes along with dark blue hair. The second was a shorter girl, a Lolita to say the least. Blonde hair which was set in twin pigtails, this little female had a very bright smile. The taller blue-haired woman smiled politely while her yellow eyes began to widen the moment she got a better look at Azazel. The little blonde one also began to show a look of concern. Instantly Issei jumped as the blonde and the blue-haired maids pointed toward Azazel and spoke in unison. Azazel Sama, Azazel pointed at himself in confusion while squinting toward the two girls. Then his smile turns into a grin. Mittelt, Kalawarner, interesting seeing the two of you here. 
Chapter 34, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 34, Birds of a Feather. Scene Kyoto, Maid Cafe. Wait a second, I've heard of you too. The president said both of your names back at the church. She was holding onto a handful of black feathers and claimed you were killed. So, you two survived. Well, about that, Issei's nervous smile now dissolved into a flat and stoic look. Azazel looked back at Issei while placing his arms on the teen's shoulder. Easy there, Mr. Badass. The governor now turns his attention toward Mittelt and Kalawarner while showing a very serious look. I am sure they have a great explanation for us, don't you? Ladies, not here, not around the customers. Mittelt now looked toward the packed restaurant as the booths were almost filled to capacity. Kalawarner then places an index finger toward her lips as she looks nervous. Shish, the kitchen. Mittelt nods over enthusiastically. Yes, you too, please follow us to the kitchen, we have a small table for the staff. We can talk over some drinks, okay. Azazel looks toward Issei as he shrugs his shoulders. Issei returns a now confused look. Then the two nod as they follow the two fallen dressed as maids, into the back kitchen area. The taller woman was incredibly beautiful yet her stare suggested danger. Hawk-like facial features along with her piercing yellow eyes, all of this was enhanced by long and thick navy blue hair. Her hairstyle was nothing too fancy however it left a long blue strand which always seemed to cover one of her eyes. Despite her height, which was at least six feet and a half the woman had incredible shape to her body. Her legs, as they were exposed due to her very high black and white maid skirt were the color of marble and flawless in every aspect. And, as Azazel mentioned earlier, from what his friends told him, this woman had a chest that could stand toe to toe, or rather, tit to tit, with that of Akino or Rias. Meanwhile, the smaller one looked to be around the age of 11 or 12 years. What Issei couldn't fathom was that a little girl like this was associated with something as foul as Rainair. Remembering how those very large and bright blue eyes of hers looked so innocent, it was hard to imagine her throwing a light spear into your belly. Trying not to think about it, Issei attempted to push his thoughts toward something more pleasant. Instantly, a fond memory materialized within the brain of the team. It was Sona and himself, sitting together under the futon, while reading books together back at Yusaka's castle. Taking a deep breath, Issei continued through the corridor that led to the kitchen area. Mittel pointed toward the large table and nervously smiled. I, I can make you something to drink if you like, Azazel Sama. Erm, would you like something too, mister? Mittel turned her attention from Azazel to now Issei, as her eyes seemed to focus directly into Issei's. Seeing that childlike face, Issei couldn't help but smile. Oh, you can call me Issei, kiddo. And, yeah, I am. Actually craving coffee now. Azazel and Kalawarner both lift an eyebrow. Meanwhile, Mittelt stutters for a moment as her nervous smile turns into a warmer one. K, K, kiddo. Oh, erm, yeah, you got it, Issei kun, coffee coming right up. Mittelt then darted over toward the large and silver appliances and began working the espresso machine. She had to stand on a stool which Issei thought was rather cute. After Azazel and Issei sat down, Kalawarner sat on the opposite side while blankly looking back toward the two males. Azazel then scratches his stubble under his chin and proceeds to clear his throat. Alright, so, what happened to the both of you and why are you in hiding? Yelling over the espresso machine, Mittelt proceeded to explain. We were coerced, boss. Kokabil talked a lot of the lower echelons to bring their subordinates to this meeting, back at that smelly old church in Kuo town. Mittelt now had four servings of espresso. She placed them on a tray and made her way toward the table. Once she sat down alongside Kalawarner, Mittelt handed out each person's drink. After the little blonde fallen took a sip of her coffee, she continued on. As you know, boss, we were assigned to Rainair's wing alongside Donaseek. Issei cringes at the mentioned name of Rainair. Kalawarner now shows a hint of concern as her stare is now directly on Issei. Her eyes slowly widened, Azazel also noticed the sudden jerk that the teen had made once he heard, her, name. Mittelt waited a moment, noticing that both her partner and her boss were staring at the teenager suddenly. Then she clears her throat. Ahem, as I was saying, that traitor was completely alright with Kokobale's plans, actually, both of them, 
Don Aseek and Rainier, they both had no issues with the bloody missions they were given. Issei cringed once again, this time his teeth began to grind as his smile turned into a frown. Kala Warner slowly tilts her head as her attention momentarily turns toward Azazel, who only shook his head slowly back at the blue-haired woman. Understanding what that silent gesture meant, Kala Warner came to the conclusion that Rainier had done something to this child in front of her. Mittelt noticed it this time. She took another moment while exchanging looks with Azazel, who simply nodded for her to continue. All right, well, those two did some things, along with that freak, Freed and his band of exorcists. Aside from the humans that were killed, there was also this nun. Issei's eyes widened as he stood from his seat. As his bangs were covering his eyes, Issei spoke very quietly. You, you were there. You let her do, that, to Asia. You were there, the whole time. Kala Warner slammed both of her hands down onto the table. This grabbed everyone's attention including a distraught Issei. What were we supposed to do? It was only two of us, versus all of them, not to mention, Kokobale himself. We couldn't even get back to Grigori to report, we were being watched the entire time. Only when we were attacked by a group of devils, did we manage to use a flashbang and escape. We've been in hiding since. Kala Warner now removes her hands from the table and chugs her espresso in one gulp while showing a very frustrated look. Issei got a hold of himself and tried to put himself into their shoes. Assuming they were telling the truth in all of this, Issei couldn't imagine himself doing much better. Sure, he would die trying, but that was the kind of person he was. But, in the end, would it have saved Asia? Issei didn't want to admit it, but he didn't think so. Now sitting back down, Issei folded his arms and kept his head down. Then, he heard a familiar sound. It was the sound of a kid, trying not to cry, but failing spectacularly. Looking up now, the teen noticed the blonde one, she had a hand over one of her eyes as she was sniffling. After a few more sudden breaths, Mittel looked directly back toward Issei with very watery blue eyes. We, we, were sorry, Issei-kun. I felt really bad about what Rainier did to that poor child. I wasn't even there when it happened. Don Aseek had us patrolling the church grounds when she used that stolen machine to capture her precious sacred gear. I know, you probably think we're monsters, don't you? Mittelt then bursted into tears. Issei immediately became very flustered. Trying to force a smile, Issei apprehensively reached over the table and slowly began to pat the blonde fallen on her head. To him, across this table was just a little kid, who was scared. It reminded him instantly of little Kuno. He then remembered her crying, back when she was kidnapped. Slowly, the forced smile turned into a natural one as the little blonde looked back up and toward Issei with those teary and large blue eyes. Azazel slowly began to smile as he searched his pockets for his pack of cigarettes. Meanwhile, Kala Warner studied this situation with great interest. She continued to watch the interaction between her colleague and this teenager, though she still was begging the question, what did Rainier do to him? Issei then spoke up as he attempted to choke back a few of his own tears. It's all right, Mittelt Chan, is it? It's fine, you were just scared, I don't blame you, so don't cry anymore, okay, kiddo. Mittelt then tilts her head as she sucks back up a blob of snot from her pale nose. She then looks at Azazel. Seeing the reaction between the two, Azazel then puts on his serious face and shakes his head while implying, no. Mittelp then shrugs as her attitude changes into one that was more childish than before. Yeah, erm, kiddo, okay then. Sniff, sniff, well, thank you, Issei-kun, for being a nice senpai. Sniff. Mittelp now reaches for the napkin holder while blowing her nose shortly after. Azazel then located his pack while looking at both girls while pointing toward them. Can I smoke in here? Kala Warner reaches across the table and snags the pack from Azazel. This surprises the governor as the blue-haired angel pulls a cigarette for herself. She then opens the window pane that was above their table next to the wall while proceeding to light her smoke while tossing the pack back toward the governor. She then takes a long drag and blows smoke out of the window. After a moment, she looks back toward Issei, who was still patting a happier-looking Mittelt on her head. As their eyes locked, Kala Warner took another drag and tossed her cigarette out the window. Sitting back down and facing the teenager, the stressed woman took a deep breath. 
What did Rainair do to you? Kala Warner showed little emotion however her hawk-like stare was very intense. Issei stopped his patting of Mittelt while his smile completely vanished. Ra, Rainair, well, she um, trying again, Issei attempted to answer this question with great difficulty. She, she, um, she. Azazel places his hand on Issei's shoulder once again. Once this happens, Issei gets quiet as he lowers his head, allowing his bangs to cover his eyes. Would it be easier if I took over from here? After all, it's why I wanted to talk with you. Azazel shows a concerned smile. Issei doesn't reply, however he slowly nods. Mittelt looks as though she is about to cry again. Seeing the difference in this boy's attitude, the moment her friend asked about Rainer, clearly, something bad had happened to this boy named Issei. Kala Warner continues to keep her eyes on Issei's lowered head while refusing to blink. Rainer disguised herself as a high school student. She then approached the kid while asking him on a date. After the date, she then proceeded to slowly kill him. After a bit of research, I found out that she assumed Issei here had a sacred gear, a twice critical to be precise. So, Kokobiel doesn't like humans already, but he really hates humans that have sacred gears. At some point, the Grigori vault was raided and a piece of lost technology was stolen, a sacred gear extractor. Rainer, being as weak as she was, thought that she could be of greater value in the war effort, if she were to acquire a specific gear called, Twilight Healing. Shortly after killing Issei, she searched for another human by the name of Asia Argento. From there, you two already know the rest. Issei begins to shiver as both of his arms are now grasping his own head. Mittelt is silently crying as she stares at the broken teen across the table. Kala Warner continues her hawk-like stare toward Issei's hidden face while she maintains a look of calm. Azazel lights a cigarette as he stands up while giving Issei a single pat on his shoulder before moving closer toward the window. Kid, I am so sorry she did that to you. She needlessly caused you to suffer both mentally and physically. The fact that she spent all of that time pretending to be a normal human girl, going on a date, going through the motions, only to sadistically leave you to bleed to death. She could have simply taken you out, quickly and painlessly. It was well within her power and training, however, she clearly enjoyed tormenting you, Issei. Azazel took a deep puff. With his hands now covering his face, Issei's head simply shook from right to left. Kala Warner begins to show a look of anger. Her face contorts into a slight scowl. Feeling absolutely terrible about the situation, Mittelt reaches across the table for one of Issei's hands. Pulling one of his hands from one side of his face, everyone was able to see a look of pure rage in one of Issei's eyes. As wide as his eyelids would allow, his normally warm and brown color eye was now flickering with bright and glowing colors of emerald. Mittelt then jumped the moment his eyeball turned toward her, however she did not let go of his hand. Issei was seeing images of Rainer throwing light spears into the body of Asia in some nightmarish hallucination. However, two bright and blue orbs seemed to come into focus and Issei is drawn back into reality. Now looking at a frightened Mittelt, Issei realized she was holding one of his hands. As his eye color returned to normal, Issei showed a puzzled look. What happened? Chapter 35, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 35, New Orders. Scene, Kyoto, Maid Cafe. Oh, nothing, Issei-kun, hee hee. Noticing that Issei's face now had its warm features back, Mittelt simply nervously smiled while wiping her face free of tears with her free hand. Issei tilts his head but nods after a moment. Well, anyway, it's fine. As you both said, you were coerced and had terrible odds in your favor. I can't be mad about that. Azazel nods as he takes another drag from his cigarette. Well, I gotta say, I can't agree more with the kid. As far as I am concerned, you two are no longer Kia nor are you considered traitors any longer. Welcome back, sisters. Mittelt began to smile brightly as tears started to build up once again. Thank you, Azazel Sama. Kala Warner folds her arms and nods silently. Issei, realizing he was still holding onto the smaller blonde's hand, decided to withdraw his own. The moment he attempted to release his hold, Mittelt chose to tighten hers. Issei then looked nervous. Mittelt turns her attention toward Issei and shakes her head. No, after all, Ima, kiddo so I need my hand held when I am stressed. 
Issei found that last part of what she had just said a bit suspicious. As Mittelt began to show a mischievous grin, the team was thinking about her actually being a child in the first place. Azazel then choked on his cigarette as he began to laugh out loud. Kalawarna, who continues to keep her eyes on the boy, noticed the suspicion in his expression. She found it very cute. Slowly a half-smirk began to creep its way along the blue-haired woman's lips as her yellow eyes relaxed a bit. Issei glanced toward Azazel while proceeding to scowl, afterwards he looked back toward Middelt, who was now giggling. Okay, there is a joke here and I think I finally get it. Middelt chan you are not a kid, right? Deciding that Azazel would now be alright with it, Middelt shakes her head while still showing a smirk. Issei forcefully pulls his hand away. At first, this made the little blonde frown, but that was only momentary as her grin returned. Well, I may not look it, but I will be 156 years old in three months. Mittelt grows a blush along with her grin. Issei tilts his head while looking a bit flustered. That, that's, but, you're so, well, little. Mittelt immediately puffs her cheeks out. Are you calling me short? Issei shakes his head nervously. I'll have you know, Ima grown up. I can even drive, though, I can't get my license. The guy at the office said that I look too young to get an international driving permit. No matter how much I protested, he outright refused. Kala Warner now giggles suddenly, looking over toward the taller woman, Issei noticed her slight smirk. They said you were physically too small to drive without needing special accommodations, accommodations that, if I recall, you outright refused. Kala Warner didn't break her eye contact with Issei while she made this statement. Issei slowly chuckled a bit, remembering the stool Mittelt used in order to make them espresso. Mittelt puffs her cheeks out once more. Shut up. Don't tell him that. Issei at some point decided that these angels were alright in his book. They seemed to be like normal people. The team didn't notice any malicious behavior, nothing that would suggest they were fucked up and twisted like Rainier was. Deciding that the coffee was actually quite good, Issei finished his cup and looked toward Middelt. Well, to be perfectly honest with you, there is nothing wrong with your height, kiddo. Also, you make excellent coffee, something only grown-ups can do. Issei then winks while smiling warmly. Middelt immediately gets flustered as her smirk turns into a nervously smile. Oh, um, right. Sure, yeah, okay. The little angel continues to struggle to find the right words however she fails at this as well. Azazel then scratches the stubble under his chin once again. Sorry to ruin the mood, but I gotta get going soon. Penemu is chomping at the bit with plenty of unsigned policies and other random paperwork, so, yeah, work work. Also, as far as Kokobiel is concerned, he's gone rogue, along with his followers. So, I think it's best that everyone sticks together as I have no idea what he has planned. Though I doubt he would be stupid enough to attack Kyoto, after all, Issei's wife would have a thing or two to say about that. Wife. Both Kala Warner and Mittelt questioned at the same time in unison. Issei blushes heavily and nervously rubs the back of his head. Azazel sees this and proceeds to laugh. It's true. Issei here is married to none other than Yasaka of Kyoto. Heck. He even has his own kid too. He is quite the dog if you ask me. Azazel playfully scoffs. Mittelt and Kalawarner look at one another as the two blush. Kalawarner looks back at Issei with yellow shaped hearts in her eyes. You have a child of your own. Mittelt also turns her attention toward the flustered team. Smiling, she asks the question again. Issei kun, you have a kid. Before Issei could reply, Kalawarner then shows a look of realization. Wait, did you say, Yusaka of Kyoto? You're not telling us that this boy is married to the leader of the Yukai faction. But she is, well, Kala Warner looks down at her very impressive chest, though she feels inadequate suddenly. Mittelt now changes her expression to a look of sheer horror. Oh no, that Yusaka is also, the boob queen, not good, not good at all. Both girls looked absolutely depressed suddenly. Issei was still rubbing the back of his head nervously. Azazel giggled to himself at the display in front of him. Azazel then speaks up after he threw his cigarette butt out the window. Don't be too sad, I have it on good authority that Issei has dreams of being a harem king. Issei stands up suddenly while blushing intensely. Dude, shut it already. 
Azazel ignores him and continues on while smirking. Heck he already is dating Seraphal Leviathan not to mention, her little sister, Sona Citri. I'd say he's well on his way to becoming Harem King. Kalawarner and Mitelf are grinning suddenly. Their attitudes changed the moment they heard, Harem. Now two pairs of eyes, one set blue, the other, yellow, were glaring maliciously toward the team, as if he was fresh meat. Issei shakes his head while waving his arms out slightly. First off, the marriage was a sudden kind of thing. Actually, so are the Citri sisters, but that's not the point. Also, technically, little Kuno, well, she's more of a distant relative if anything. Mitelt replies while still showing her grin. So, this Kuno isn't your daughter then? Issei snapped back with a bit of passion behind his voice. Kuno is my daughter. Kalawarner nods as her grin turns into a warmer smile. So, you have a daughter then? Well, I find that very mature of you, to assume such a responsibility. Mitelt's grin also softens into a warm smile. That's really cute, Issei-kun. As the two girls were now leaning against the table with their hands propped below their chins, they both looked very dreamily toward the standing and now very flustered Issei Hyodo. The teen continues to rub the back of his head even more intensely as his nervousness increases. Azazel proceeds to lightly smack the table with one of his hands. Instantly both girls turned their attention toward Azazel, who now had both of his arms crossed. Smirking, the governor looked at both of the fallen girls. All right, listen up, Mittelt, Kalawarner, since you've been reinstated, I've decided on a mission for the both of you. Azazel then nods to himself. Kalawarner tilts her head while showing a puzzled frown. Very well, what is this mission of yours? Mittelt looks at her empty cup and then back toward the governor. Okay. Issei proceeds to sit down as Azazel begins to pace the room as he extends an index finger into the air. I'm heading out in a second so, Azazel then walks behind Kalawarner while crouching a bit. He then moves his head toward Kalawarner's left ear and begins to whisper something. As both Mitelt and Issei looked toward the two with suspicion, Kalawarner's frown began to form into an all-out grin. She then nodded as Azazel moved away and went back to his pacing of the room. Instantly, Kala Warner stood from her seat while her piercing yellow eyes targeted a specific brown-haired boy. Mittelt watched as Kala Warner walked from behind her and around the table toward Issei. As far as Issei himself, he couldn't look away from those yellow eyes. Almost as if he was staring directly at a hungry alpha wolf, the teen wanted to jump from his seat and out of the door, however he was frozen in place. Now the tall and blue-haired fallen was standing directly in front of a still-sitting Issei. Being thankful that Kalawarner had a very large chest, at this angle, he was no longer staring at the angel's eyes. However, Issei retracted this thought of thankfulness after the next few moments. Without saying a word, Kalawarner's hands began to move toward the buttons of her maid top. Slowly, she began to unbutton her shirt and stopped toward the midsection. Her large, pale and firm breasts were halfway exposed. In a very quick instance, Kalawarner proceeded to wrap both of her arms around the boy's head and neck. As Issei threw his arms about, he came to the conclusion that this woman works out. Mittelt stood up and was about to protest, however Azazel shook his head. As the teen was completely muffled by Kalawarner's generous assets, Azazel then snapped his finger a few times. Hey, kid, can you hear me? Azazel then clapped his hands a few times. Kalawarner looked down at the squished face of her prey as her smirk turned into a lustful smile. Don't worry, boss, he can't hear a word. Azazel nods. Good job. All right, so, I want you two to tail this kid from now on. Escort him back to that convention, afterwards, make yourselves scarce. Kalawarner looks back up at Azazel as she holds the teen in place. Why? Mittelt nods and points toward Kalawarner. What she said. Azazel facepalms, it's because I feel bad about the kid and all. Besides, he was directly affected by your ex-wing leader, right? I figured you both already took a liking to him, so I just came up with this plan like 30 seconds ago. And, also, there is that girl, Asia Argento. Mittelt shows a sad frown. Yeah, the poor kid. Azazel nods while showing a small smirk. Yeah, she is probably dealing with a lot as well, because of us and all. Mittelt tilts her head, you mean, was, right. Azazel shakes his head, nah, she's alive, 
That Rias Grimori brought her back as a devil. Both Kalawarner and Mittelt widened their eyes in surprise. Actually, I have it on good authority that Issei over there, he actually begged the Grimori heiress to resurrect her. Azazel then looks at his wrist watch. Kalawarner looks back down and smiles warmly. She then tightens her hug which is now completely suffocating Issei. What a good boy. Good boy. My. Very good boy. Kalawarner's lustful smile returned. Mittelt is jumping up and down. Yay. She's alive. Devil or not, she's alive. That's wonderful news, Azazel Sama. Azazel nods proudly as Issei now begins to slap his hands around. Azazel notices this and pays more attention to Issei's skin color, which was now turning a shade of purple. Hey, Kalawarner, I said to keep him deafened, not suffocate him. Azazel points toward the lack of thrashing from the muffled team. Kalawarner's eyes widen as she releases a now huffing and puffing Issei. Chapter 36, Sona's Chance, a high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 36, Anime Convention. Scene, Kyoto Square, Office District. You know, I have to ask. First off, why did you, hug, me like that earlier, Kalawarner Chan? Secondly, what did that no good Azazel say while I was, hugged? Even in that situation, Issei took a large gulp. I was still able to hear muffled noises. So I know you guys were saying something. Issei then shakes his head from left to right while showing a look of panic. And third, why are the two of you holding my hands? Walking along a crowded sidewalk, we can see our main protagonist as he looks around the street while noticing strange glances from those around him. Feeling incredibly nervous, Issei then looked at the two women, who both had hold of each of his arms. Meanwhile, both girls simply looked forward and simply nodded without saying a word. Kalawarner had a half smile while being somewhat hidden by a large strand of blue hair. She was wearing a black leather jacket along with a yellow sundress underneath. She was also wearing matching heels as the dress cut off near her thighs. Her partner in crime, Mittelt, was wearing a fictional schoolgirl uniform. This specific one was a cosplay of the fictional school from the Milky Spiral series. It was a white uniform that ended in a purple skirt along with a navy-style purple sash. As usual, the smaller Fallen had her blonde hair set up in twin tails. Mittelt had a bright and warm smile as she gripped Issei's arm tightly. Finally having enough of their enigmatic responses, Issei stopped walking which prompted the two girls to stop as well. As Mittelt now looked up and toward Issei, while Kalawarner had to actually look down at him, the teen's eyebrow twitched. Seriously? What did he tell you? I ain't moving another step until you tell me. Issei now showed a sudden look of determination as he showed the slightest of grins. As Mittelt was deep in thought, Kalawarner came up with an idea that could change the subject. Kalawarner smirks while showing a blush. Issei kun, well, if you insist on the matter. Very well, I was ordered to show you a good time in the red light district of Kyoto. Ahem, Azazel Sama wants us to be very, how should I say? Oh yes, accommodating, so, would you like to get on with it now? Or after this stupid gathering thing? The blue-haired angel ended there with a wink. Issei's jaw went agape while Mittelt looked very confused. Kalawarner then turned her head back in front and began to pull Issei forward. Without a word, the three continued on as Kalawarner smirked victoriously. A large crowd of people were gathered outside of a massive casino building. A great deal of these individuals were either wearing costumes or anime series t-shirts. Instantly, 40 to 50 percent of the entire crowd now turned their attention toward Issei, who had two very beautiful ladies on each of his arms. All of the sudden, a few random folks ran up toward the three and asked for photos with them. Kalawarner sneered as Mittelt smiled nervously. Issei on the other hand, he wanted nothing to do with any of this, so he pulled the two along and marched toward the entrance with a look of sheer determination. There was about four different lines as guards were checking for tickets. Issei then looked at each of the girls. Um, Mittelt Chan, Kalawarner Chan, do either of you happen to have tickets to this thing? Issei shrugged his shoulders while now looking quite nervous as some of those same people began to creep up with their phones and cameras. Kalawarner could see the stress in the kid's features and decided to do something about it. 
Turning her head while getting one of her eyes to focus on the small group of people, the tall woman showed a terrifying scowl as she made her declaration, very loudly. Oi, if you know what's good for ya, you'll scram, now. Kala Warner's voice was deep and very authoritative. This threat, warning, whatever you want to call it, well, it worked as the hardcore otaku fans scurried off. Meanwhile, Mitelp took her one finger out from her ear while smiling. Issei could hear a slight ringing in his ears however he couldn't argue the fact that Kala Warner had quite the commanding presence. Issei Kun, hearing a familiar voice coming from behind him, Issei felt both of his arms get released. Looking from right to left, Kala Warner and Mitelp were now gone. Before Issei could make sense of what had just happened, he felt a bone-crushing hug toward his midsection. Instantly, flashes from cameras and phones began to relentlessly blind the teen as the sounds of ooh, and, ah, were filling the air. Isei-kun, what took you so long? Boo, that is Azul Baka, I sure hope he was a nice angel to you. He, was, right, as the team continued to endure this hug, it all became clear that this person was none other than his girlfriend, Seraphal. But what was up with all the flash photography? As the boy's eyes adjusted, he noticed the Mao looking back up at him with a very warm smile. She was wearing a different version of her Milky Chan costume. Issei wanted to ask if this was perhaps her new outfit for the upcoming season however he was currently distracted by all of the fans. Hey, what kind of spell did you cast on Milky Chan? How dare you? What's your name? Wow, so it turns out that Milky has a boyfriend Kuhn. Oh, the scandal. Wait a minute. Idols can have boyfriends now, right? Can I get one with you holding Milky in a bridal embrace? Shut up, you damned simp. Issei then smiled and proceeded to move his mouth closer to Seraphal's ear as the noise was almost deafening. I wanted to come sooner, but some things happened, also, I don't have tickets. Seraphal then pulls Issei closer with her right hand against the back of his head. Smirking, she shows a hint of lust behind those large and beautiful blue eyes. Cleary, my number one fan has forgotten who I am. Tickets you say, follow your milky chan. She will get you in through the door. Also, Kisu right there, in front of the crowd, Seraphal proceeded to kiss Issei on the mouth. It was only a peck but it was enough to cause a bit of uproar. As Issei was now speechless, Seraphal then pointed at the discombobulated team. Smiling proudly, Seraphal then pointed at all of the onlookers. Hello everyone, I am so glad that you've all shown up to this fun event. Yay, well, I have an official announcement. Finally free of Seraphal, Issei thought it best to try and scoot out from eyesight, however the Mao reached from behind her while gripping the boy's shirt and pulling him back and beside her. Ahem, as I was saying, this goofy coon right here, well, his name is Issei and he is my boyfriend. I know that will break a lot of your hearts out there, boo, I am so sorry. But know that Milky loves each and every one of you, and to prove how much I love all of you, I am going to do a special signing event toward the late afternoon and they will all be free of charge. As the small crowd cheered, others were shouting out questions involving Milky Chan's relationship with this random team. Ignoring the questions, Seraphal simply waved while pulling Issei along toward the entrance way. Walking past the lines of people, the two guards moved a few separation cones to allow the couple access. Once inside, Issei took a good look around. It was a large place full of booths and different memorabilia. Life-size poster cutouts of different characters from an assortment of manga and anime littered the hallways. Then, Issei felt a sudden pain toward his shoulder. As Issei was looking around, he failed to notice none other than Valley. He was carrying a pair of plastic bags in each of his arms as he looked to have purposely ran his own shoulder into Issei's as he walked past him and toward the exit. Looking behind him, Issei shouted at the smirking white-haired team. Hey, smash loser, that freaking hurt, you ass. Valley said nothing and continued on his way. Sticking his tongue out, Issei then turned his attention toward Seraphal while rubbing the sore spot on his shoulder. Seraphal tilts her head, oh, that was the rude boy that Yusaka almost annihilated earlier. Well, he'd best be careful. If you get a bruise there, well, let's just say that my good friend and your wife, she has a bit of a temper. Boo. Well, can't be helped I suppose. Issei gave Seraphal a very serious look. Yasaka, I can't see her having a mean bone in her body. 
She's really nice and gentle. Seraphal smirks as she now pats. Issei's on his head cutely. You are such a good boy, Issei-kun. But I assure you, nine-tailed foxes are something you do not want to cross. They can be very, well, protective. At the same time, they can be ruthless to those who they deem to be a threat to either themselves or their family. Issei nods while maintaining his serious features. Well, let's just not bring up this whole valley thing to Yusaka then, alright? Seraphal tilts her head the other way. Okies. Well then, let's go find everyone. But, before we do, I wanted to tell you something. Issei shows a worried smile. Sure, what's up? Nodding Seraphal shows a slight smirk along with a growing blush. Tonight, well, would you mind spending the night with me in my room? Before you answer, don't worry about Sona. I've already cleared it with her and she is fine with it. Placing his index finger toward his chin, Issei slowly nods. Well, if you and Sona are okay with it, I won't refuse. Issei begins to blush heavily. Oh yay, you're willing. I don't have to use any restraining devices, I guess I can send them back for a refund. Seraphal was happily replying and didn't catch herself in that last sentence as she places both of her hands over her own mouth. Issei was quiet for a moment as he wasn't quite sure he heard what he heard correctly. Milky, did you just say something about restraining devices? Or was that just a joke? Seraphal nods very overenthusiastically. Oh, yup, it was totally a joke, funny right? Ha 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 ha. The Moa then showed a guilty looking blush. Issei scratches the back of his head while squinting at Seraphal's body language. Right. Okay then. Well, just in case, let me say that I am more than willing to have a sleepover in your room tonight. The teen ended his sentence with a very nervous smile. Seraphal's face then contorted into that of a grumpy child as her cheeks began to puff out. I am not into domination, if that's what you're thinking. This gathered the attention of several individuals within the vicinity of about four kiosks worth. As Issei looked around at the other people staring at him and Milky Chan, he stopped at a specific set of golden-colored eyes. The teen assumed these had to be contacts as the pupils had cat-like slits. Not only that, this woman was dressed as a Neko Masumi, a cat girl. Curiously, her costume must have cost quite the pretty penny as her black ears and twin black tails, both were moving in random increments. She was wearing a loosely fit kimono, black with red inlay. Wearing a yellow sash, she had a pair of thick Shinto prayer beads attached to one side. She was very pretty as Issei locked eyes with the woman, who was now smirking. Then, the teen saw it, her pupils, those slits, they became round. Those were not eye contacts, which meant she wasn't human. But then, Issei thought, so what? Who cares if a Neko chick is here? I mean, Yusaka and little Kuno are around here somewhere, so why should I give a shit about that, Erm, really hot and big chested kitty chick. Ha, ha, I wonder if she plays with balls of yarn. As Issei was dreamily staring off into the crowd, Seraphal was getting tired from the lack of attention from her boyfriend. Reaching behind her and out of eye shot, the Mal materialized her signature heart-shaped scepter while then using it to bonk the daydreaming Issei on his head. B-O-N-K. Issei was now rubbing his head while looking at a disgruntled Seraphal. Smiling nervously, Issei continued to massage his sore head while looking back toward where the cat girl was. She had all but vanished. Taking a quick glance around the room, the teen then laid his eyes back toward the ever so grumpy, Mao Seraphal Leviathan. No need to be so forceful, Milky. That hurt. Also, you have my attention. So, what's up? Issei smiled nervously. Still with her cheeks puffed out, Seraphal replies as she subconsciously spins her scepter around in one hand. Well, you just seemed preoccupied as all. I saw you staring at that Nako woman and it made me oh so very jealous. Issei crouches down a bit while looking into Seraphal's large and blue eyes. As her eyes widen at this sudden action, Issei speaks up in a soft tone. There is absolutely no need to be jealous, Milky Chan. After all, I am your number one fan, right? As Seraphal blushes, she takes a quick glance around the room with her eyes and begins to smirk. If that's true, kiss me, right now. Issei now grows a blush and his nervousness intensifies threefold. Also taking a quick glance around the room, the team could see excited looks from the onlookers. Shit, why now? In front of all these people, 
I don't think I can. Seraphal then grows impatient as she uses her free hand to grip Issei's collar and pull him in. Instantly, Kisu, with their lips locked together, flashes from phones and cameras began to go off in rapid succession. Scene, Kuo Academy, stupid Grafia, I swear, that bitch is a taskmaster from hell. Oh wait, well shit, we now see Rias Grimori, wearing her usual olive green jumpsuit. She had a large mop in hand as she looked to be swabbing a nearly drained swimming pool. As she was wringing out the mob head into a large metal bucket, the Grimori heiress continued to talk to herself while maintaining a constant scowl. Well, at least this week of hell is almost done and over with. After this, I can then be with my Issei. Speaking of, I need to come up with something to help patch things over. Rias then jumped back into the almost drained pool and began to swab once again. What does he like? You know, I don't think I've ever asked him what he likes. I mean, I know he is a pervert, so that part is easy, but what else? Wait a minute, pervert, that's it, Eureka. Unknown to Rias, there was a reflection in the small layer of still water within the pool. A skeletonized version of what seemed to be a camel, looked to be watching Rias from under feet. He really likes that one familiar. That's it, I'll get him one of those things. Rias then nodded victoriously as her scowl turned into a hopeful smile. Rias, Rias, the Grimori heiress now froze in place. Hearing the voice coming from under her, Rias slowly looked down as her eyes widened in horror. C.A., C.A., Camel. No, Rias's hair immediately stood on its own. She then felt something tickling her bare feet which made her do a strange dance within the puddles of water. Looking down again, Rias saw the phantom camel, attempting to lick at Rias's own feet. No, jumping from out of the pool, Rias Grimori ran toward the school building while screaming loudly. Camel, camel, no, scene unknown location, in a darkly lit and large room, we see old oil paintings of different men and women, all with silver hair, all in different scenes. Some scenes showed these individuals slaying dragons, demons or other monstrous things. Other scenes were that of daily life either in or outdoors. Meanwhile, three people were standing in this dimly lit room. Valley was standing next to the Nako woman that was recently seen back at the convention in Kyoto. They were both standing in front of a large and cushioned chair. Sitting on the chair was a girl. She looked to be in the age category of about 8 or 9 years of age. She had long black hair as well as vacant grey colored eyes. Wearing a black Lolita style dress, the girl sits motionless while staring directly at Valley and Kuroka. It's done. I've placed the tracker on him. So, enjoy the show, Ophis. Valley nodded while showing off a grin. N.Y.A. I must. Say. He is quite cute. Era era. Kuroka was smiling with a mildly wicked grin as she adjusted her kimono. The little girl now known as Ophis, tilts her head without changing her vacant expression. I fail to understand the concept of attraction. It means nothing. All that matters is silence. I will observe this child and make my decision. You will leave. Valley nods as he leaves the room all while maintaining a grin. Kuroka followed behind while seemingly daydreaming about something. Valley then internally spoke with his dragon, Albon. Think it was a good idea to tell her about Azazel's information regarding the Red Dragon Emperor. I think you should settle your own petty squabbles in a more honorable way. Regardless, the outcome remains the same, assuming your plan actually works. Really, I find it quite amusing actually. Going to the Infinite Dragon God and telling her that your enemy has the ability to transfer his boosts to others, oh Albon, I find it hilarious and the outcome of your plan involves Dedrag being consumed by the Ouroboros dragon. Valley, that's a bit, how do you say? Fucked up, yeah, that's it, I think this fate that you have planned for both my rival and his host is indeed, fucked up. We can agree to disagree, but I will get my revenge on that edge guarding cheating bastard. Valley continues to walk down a large and dark hallway with a proud smirk. Kuroka notices this and tilts her head. You really don't like that kid, NYA. Kuroka continued her head tilt and then placed one of her arms into the air while making a Nako paw gesture while winking cutely. Ignoring her, Valley continues on while making a scoffing sound. Kuroka felt offended by Valley's action and proceeded to stick her tongue out while pulling one of her eyelids downward, making a goofy face. Scene Convention Hotel, Kyoto. 
What took you so long, Hyodo? Sona was standing along with her peerage, all of whom were carrying multiple plastic bags full of memorabilia. She had her usual hardened features as she looked toward Seraphal and Issei walking in from the hotel lobby. As one of his hands was holding one of Seraphal's, Issei used his free hand to nervously rub the back of his hair. President, it's good to see you too. Sona froze for a moment while lifting an eyebrow. Yes, well, greetings aside, did you and the governor have a good talk? Nodding, Issei smiled. Yeah, he's an alright sort of guy, aside from his tricky bullshit. Seraphal and Sona both speak in unison. Tricky. Shrugging, Issei replies. E-H-H, don't worry about it. Issei thought about both Talawarner and Mittelt. He figured it was probably a better idea not to mention them considering they made it a point to disappear before he was tackled by Seraphal at the entrance. Seraphal then places an index finger to her chin while showing a look of deep thought. Oh, that's right, Issei-kun, I forgot to tell you. Seraphal then reaches into her magical girl-themed backpack while pulling out a few shirts. I got these for you, add them to your collection. Issei takes the clothing from Seraphal while unfolding them. Widening his eyes while smiling nervously, the teen was holding onto some milky spiral-themed shirts, both tea and long sleeve. What made Issei nervous was the fact that Seraphal signed each one of these. Similar to his other shirts, that were put in his spare room closet back at Yusaka Castle, these shirts were all signed as follows. To my number one fan, I love you. XOXOXO. Issei Hyodo, property of Milky Chan. Issei held in a cringe. Seraphal smiles brightly, I know you like to wear those red shirts under your school uniform, so I thought, how about you wear these instead? Sona protests, it's bad enough that Issei refuses to follow school code when it comes. To buttoning up his overshirt and wearing a tie. But to wear lewd things such as that, that's going too far and I will not turn a blind eye this time. Issei looks back at Sona with a surprised expression. Wait, are you telling me that you're the reason I never got bitched at regarding my slacker ways? Sona blushed and got quiet all of the sudden. Issei thought that there might be a chance the vice president might shed some light on all of this. Turning his head a bit, to meet the eyes of Tsubaki, Issei silently shrugged his shoulders and she noticed. As Sona was looking at her feet nervously, Tsubaki looked back toward Issei and quickly nodded. Nodding back, Issei mouths, thank you, with his lips. Tsubaki maintains her stoic attitude however a blush still grows on her cheeks. Scene Unknown Location Sitting on a black framed bed with pink colored blankets was the aforementioned Ophis. She was laying back against a set of pillows that were pushed against the headboard. While doing this, she was staring at a floating orb that was glowing in waves of purple and black. As she was watching, her vacant and stoic expression slowly changed into a look of intrigue. Hyodo Issei, Sekir Yu Red Dragon Emperor of Domination. Will you help me, willingly? Or, will you force my hand? Either way, you will help me. Ophis showed the slightest of smirks as she continued on with her observation. Meanwhile, through this purple and black colored orb, we are able to see what looked to be a video broadcast of none other than Issei. Ophis's smirk now changes into an all-out grin. Well that's all for now see you in the next part.